days, it can seem that no studio will gamble on a blockbuster movie that's not a superhero franchise or a safe adaptation. But there's one big director working today who's seemingly able to make any movie he wants, Christopher Nolan. Because his original films and unconventional adaptations are highly successful time after time, he's one of the only Hollywood directors who can command both a big budget and near complete artistic freedom. As a storyteller, you're looking for a gap in the culture. You're looking for a great story that just hasn't been addressed. 2017's Dunkirk gives us the opportunity to look back at Nolan's filmography and examine the patterns that define him through the years. Motivations are everything, Will. What did you see through the fog? Nolan was born in 1970 in London and began making films on his father's Super 8 camera at a young age. He studied English literature at University College London, and he borrowed the school's film equipment to make short films with his friends on the weekends. In 1998, he released his first feature, Following, a neo-noir about a young writer who follows strangers through the streets of London. The film cost a mere 6,000 to make, and Nolan shot it in 15-minute chunks with friends on the weekends over a couple of months. This work is little known today, but it's worth looking at because it already shows the seeds of the director's later mature style. Bill, a 30-something failed writer, is seeking inspiration for a novel. So we already see Nolan's trademark interest in storytelling itself. Makes you think I'm a writer anyway. An unemployed 20-something fancies himself a writer. A real leap into the unknown. Well, I'm not a writer. But you're interested in people. One of Bill's subjects, Cobb, a name that will pop up again in Inception, takes Bill under his wing as a thief, and things start to go south. Following set the tone for Nolan's career, with its non-linear structure, compelling plot, neo-noir feel, and limited information creating an active viewer who must string the story together. Nolan's second film, Memento, brought him instant acclaim and received two Oscar nominations for its editing and screenplay, putting Nolan on the map as a director to watch. Memento tells the story of Leonard Shelby, who's consumed with avenging his wife's death, but has severe anterograde amnesia. I guess I've already told you about my condition. Oh, well, only every time I see you. He's not able to form new memories and will forget information in minutes, which is why he's obsessed with writing everything down and even tattoos key clues on his body. In Memento, Nolan takes subjective point of view to the extreme, reflecting Leonard's condition in the disorienting structure of the film, which is split into two intercutting threads, a black and white coherent story that runs forward, alternating with a color sequence that moves backwards. But beyond the intellectual challenge of solving the puzzle, the structure finds a way to help us experience how traumatic, frustrating, and mind-bogglingly confusing Leonard's condition might feel from the inside. Renowned neuroscientist Christoph Koch called Memento the most accurate portrayal of memory loss in film. Nolan himself has said that he denies the audience the same information that the protagonist is denied. But he complicates our identification with the character. The counterintuitive emotional reveal is that Leonard doesn't want the mystery to be solved, or that he wants to solve it over and over, because the consummation of his vengeance doesn't provide him the satisfaction he thinks it will. Leonard's cycle speaks to Nolan's interest in subjective reality, and we'll continue to see Nolan's characters defiantly embracing their own subjective truths over objective reality. The often overlooked Insomnia is Nolan's only film that he had no part in writing, as it was a remake of a 1997 Norwegian film. This was his first studio picture, and it was most important as a stepping stone. Its success proved to Warner Brothers that he was the guy to reboot the Batman franchise. I'm Batman. While it might sound surprising to us now, Nolan was the first to tell Batman's origin story in a feature-length film. His version of the superhero is a darker, more realistic vigilante, instead of a cartoonish figure with superhuman capabilities. And it's easy to see how profoundly his grim Batman shaped the genre since. Refreshingly, Nolan created Batman Begins as a finished, complete telling of the vigilante's story. According to the director, the sequels were never a given. The entire film is also essentially a cold open. The title card pops up after the whole movie ends. This choice signifies the nature and purpose of the origin story. Only after the events of the first film is Batman a complete character ready to begin his journey. His Bruce Wayne is a powerful example of Nolan's affinity for multiple split selves. 
were given Bruce Wayne as Batman, plus a split within Bruce himself, between the deflecting persona of an irresponsible playboy and the damaged orphan trying to make sense of the cruel world. So the realism of Christian Bale's Batman really derives from the interplay between these different parts of himself and his persona. Know your limits, Master Wayne. Batman has no limits. Well, you do, sir. In Heath Ledger's chillingly iconic Joker, we see Nolan's interest in questioning that fragile line between heroes and villains. The Joker knows how to use the hero's moral code against him, and he wants to prove that under the right or wrong circumstances, anyone can become a villain. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. He's crafted these games to prove his bleak view of human nature, but his final game contradicts those beliefs when the people on the boats refuse to blow each other up. At the same time, Batman transforms into the Dark Knight, a heroic figure who's no longer a hero, not guided by a clear-cut, easy morality. I killed those people. That's what I can be. No, no, you can't. You're not. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. By the end of the trilogy, Bruce Wayne doesn't die, but the character he inhabits does. He decides Batman was a temporary fix for Gotham, an idea and symbol of good to inspire changes in the city, but not a permanent hero to protect citizens from evil. Created in the interim years of the Batman trilogy, The Prestige is adapted from Christopher Priest's 1995 novel. Michael Caine's John Cutter explains the three parts of any magic trick. The first part is called The Pledge, The Magician shows you something ordinary. The second act is called the turn. The magician takes the ordinary something and makes it do something extraordinary. But you wouldn't clap yet because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. The film itself is broken up into these three parts, making The Prestige feel like a self-referential investigation of movie magic. Nolan's own particular form of storytelling involves misdirection and manipulation of our expectations in order to pull off magnificent feats. As in Memento or Dark Knight, obsession, revenge, and violence are integral to the story. And we get the uniquely Nolan complex plot, non-linear storyline, divided or multiple selves, and ambiguous ending. Mr. Fisher, I'm here to protect you in the event that someone tries to access your mind through your dreams. You're not safe here. Inception can also be read as an introspective metaphor for movie making. We have a video about that if you want to click on the I in the top right corner. Knowing he would have to explain the complexities of incepting a dream into someone's mind, Nolan chose the classic heist movie because exposition is central to that genre's structure. However, he wanted to transpose the genre to work as a film about dreams, which focus on emotion and the inner workings of someone's mind. Once again, Nolan combines action and spectacle with unsettling questions about the concept of reality, raising the idea that everything might just be subjective. Mal's death and the ambiguous ending convey that reality and dreams aren't mutually exclusive or even really separate. It doesn't matter whether Cobb was dreaming in the end. The point was that he's finally happy in the reality he's chosen to believe in. He was off with his kids. He was in his own subjective reality and didn't really care anymore. And that makes a statement that perhaps all levels of reality are equally valid. We'll be waiting for you when you get back. A little older, a little wiser, but happy to see you. Interstellar is arguably the director's least Nolan-esque film. It doesn't use noir conventions, and the protagonist isn't driven by a pessimistic impulse like obsession or revenge. The emotional Interstellar ends with the age-old lesson that love conquers all, that it's the most enduring expression of humanity's place in the universe. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. I think there's something about the starkness and, and the massiveness of, of the environment they're in that really reduces this focus very tightly to human bonds and, and what makes us who we are. 
more characteristic of Nolan, the ending is ambiguous, the scale is more epic and ambitious than ever, and the audience needs to watch multiple times to understand all the science behind the plot. Nolan's research, aided here by theoretical physicist Kip Thorne, was so characteristically thorough that scientists wrote papers discussing the ending. Again, we see his preference for practical effects. He drew inspiration from 1983's The Right Stuff. As usual, he saved CGI only for when it was unavoidable. The award-winning Interstellar had 700 visual effects shots, compared to Guardians of the Galaxy's 2,750, to give some perspective. There's no hiding from this, son. We have a job to do. Turn it around! Dunkirk delves into World War II, an era we've seen a lot on screen, but the director classifies Dunkirk as more of a survival film. It recreates the 1940 rescue of Allied forces in northern France, told as a triptych from three perspectives, land, air, and water. Also in typical Nolan fashion, the movie shot on 65mm film using IMAX cameras. However, one interesting exception to Nolan's rules is that the script is a mere 112 pages, advancing mostly through wordless action. This is a departure for the director who's known for his penchant for exposition and dialogue. It's all about survival, and so it wasn't so much about words as about physicality. Similar to Interstellar, Dunkirk explores the human spirit, that which is intrinsic in us all. Also, characteristically, Nolan drew inspiration from a wide range of sometimes surprising influences. Nolan is a master adapter and mixer of unusual or counterintuitive medleys of inspirations, from art to literature to Greek mythology. Inception descends not only from heist films like On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but also noir, Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey for the practical effects, and the Greek myth of the Minotaur in the Labyrinth, which inspires the character Ariadne. Nolan is a self-professed movie buff. Batman Begins was most heavily influenced by Donner's 1978 version of Superman, because it takes place in a world that's pretty much the same as our world. Nolan's also deeply shaped by visual artists. Interstellar's two robots were inspired not by machines, but by modern art. M.C. Escher's Penrose Staircase appears in Inception, representing the infinity of our subconscious. Escher also espoused Nolan's recurring message, that you are the creator of your own subjective reality. Francis Bacon's grotesque work inspires not only the Joker's gritty makeup, but also the way Nolan's scripts are crafted. Because you never have the resources to fully create the world that, that you're creating. So you, you are leaving a lot of voids, you're leaving a lot of gaps. And so part of what you start trying to do is using those necessary gaps intelligently so that where you're not showing something, it's uh, helping you rather than feeling the limitations of the world you've created. Nolan's ambiguity, the gaps in the stories he tells, demonstrate that we can never fully create the world, but only our own representations and interpretations of that world. Through these necessary gaps, we realize more can be felt in absence. You may be grasping for resolution at the end, but he refuses to answer the questions for us. And that's really the point. My wife wasn't diabetic. You sure?